Well, friends, I never would have imagined whenever I was a young man seeing this great man of God preaching Colosseums all over the world. I would have never imagined that the day would come that I'd be able to say, that's my friend. That's my ministry partner. I certainly do not see myself as his peer in any way whatsoever, but I tell you this, he, he truly loves me and he truly loves this church. Out of all the accolades that I could list today, and I wanna tell you, he deserves every single one of them because the difference he's made through the decades is incredible, and he's still standing, he's still doing it. But I wanna tell you, honestly, I just can't think of anything more that I want you to know than this. He is my friend, and he's here today at Open Door Church. Church, let's give a great big Open Door Church welcome to Pastor Rod Parsley. How much, how much do you love Pastor Troy? No, 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 come on now. How much do you love Pastor Troy Brewer? Miss Leanna, I, they just wreck me. Y'all, you, and I'm not saying y'all because I'm in Texas. I've been saying y'all since I was born in Eastern Kentucky. You know, you know why they call West Virginia almost heaven? Because it borders Kentucky. <laughs> it's great to see y'all. I, uh, I, I want to say very clearly, God has been very good to me. My pastor and mentor, the late, great Dr. Lester Sumrall wrote me a letter just a few weeks before he went to his eternal reward. And he said, I've learned over 80 plus years that if you live your life and you come down to the closing moments and you have one or two true friends, you are a most blessed individual. So when Pastor Troy says, I'm his friend, that means everything to me. And I am his friend. And I do not know. Now, there's a law called the law of diminishing returns. Some of you pastors ought to look it up. And some of you men ought to look it up. Because that's the reason that you started off and one woman was enough. But then you had to have another one. And then women weren't enough, and so you went and got confused. And then that wasn't enough, and you went on. It's a law of diminishing returns. It means the more of the thing you have, the less it means to you. And it's, it's a very natural phenomenon. And I'm going to say these statements because I love you all so much. You are pastored by two of the greatest pastors I have ever known in my life. The vision that they possess. I've been, I've been privileged to preach not only in my own great church seven times a week, not only in Valor Christian College where world changers are made, not only in Harvest Preparatory School, nearly 1,000 students. But I've been blessed to preach all over America and around the world for the last 47 years. Yeah. This year I'll celebrate my 50th anniversary of preaching this gospel. 50 years. And... Um, over 30 of those years, I did more work than 10 evangelists. I preached on the road as well, 150 nights at least a year. That's 150 different churches and venues, and auditoriums and so forth. I have never in all of my travels 
In all of my relationships, City Harvest Network, thousands and thousands of churches across America and around the world, I have never found, including my own, a church that is getting it done like this church. And I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be here. I canceled my schedule for the last six months of this year, and this is the only place I'm coming. This is it. But I would not miss this honorable invitation. And I know I'm taking some of my time, but it's my time. I love you. I love this church. I love these pastors. I'm honored to have the Assistant General Overseer of City Harvest Network with me today from right across town, the Honorable Bishop Wendell Hutchins. Stand up. We love you, sir. All right, do you have a Bible? No, like a real Bible. I love everybody from millennials on. They got a Bible and they carry it around with them 24 hours a day. But nobody knows it's a Bible. You ought to get you one of those ones you lay on the, on the coffee table. You know, those big, great big family Bibles. Carry that around with you. That'll get somebody's attention. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, whatever way you have it, in the book, in your iPhone, in your iPad, in your I, me, and mine, whatever you've got. Grab a Bible, and we're going to talk a little bit about 12 gates. You ready? 12 gates. Now, don't get nervous, because I'm going to break it down for you. We're going to put them in four different categories, so we'll only talk specifically about four of the 12. Is that okay? Okay, that relieved a lot of folks. They're like, 12 points. If he's going to spend 10 minutes on each point, Gertrude, we're going to be here an hour and 20 minutes. So we're not going to do that, but we're going to have a good time in the Word. We've got to lay some ground rules. You ready? Frowning out of order. Silence is the language of defeat. Shouting is the language of victory. So if you have... Clapping is the language of authority. Dancing is the language of joy. Every service at the Harvard in Columbus, Ohio, we have track stars because running is the language of freedom. If you're, ch if you're in change, you can't run. Are you listening to me? Well, we think running would be out of order. No. No, nope, no, nope. clapping is in order. Shouting is in order. Clap your hands, all you people, shouting to God with a voice of triumph. The church has been entirely too quiet. If you believe it, shout amen. All right, we're going to begin in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Should be one of the most relevant chapters in your Bible with what's going on in the world right now with Hezbollah in the north of Israel, Hamas in the south of Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Egypt surrounding the people of God. We may have already begun the last battle before the rapture of the church. Everybody say rapture. Now, a lot of Christians are like coffee pots. They like to percolate. You like to tribulate. We're not going to tribulate. We're not. He has not appointed us unto wrath. And the first load, we out of here. Shove your neighbor and say, I'm out of here. First load. Hang around if you want to, but I'm out of here. When the magnificent magnitude of his perfect person sweeps out from north to south and east to west, it won't matter if you're a mile under 
the crusty surface of this people planet in a coal mine or what I did last night, 43,000 feet flying in here at 600 miles an hour. 55 miles an hour is not God's idea of how to get anywhere. God travels at the speed of thought and I'm trying to catch up. He said, before your mind can form my name to speak out of your mouth, I'll be there. I said, amen. I said, amen. Come on, shove your name and say, we're going we're to move faster. Faster than the magnificent magnitude of his perfect person will sweep out from north to south and east to west. He's coming. I said, faster than the fleetest hoof ever struck a pavement or a wheel ever turned on an axle. Jesus is coming and he's coming very, very, very soon. And Matthew 24 makes it plain. Everybody that's ready when he, when he calls, throw both, both hands up in the air and let's have a rapture drill. Come on, I'm out of here. And I cannot wait for some of these new preachers, you know. New, as I said, I've been doing this 50 years. It's not my first meeting. And, and, and I, like, I like to listen to them try to explain the Bible away. Well, we're going to... No, hold on. Hold on. The trumpet of God will sound. That's tabernacles. Passover, fulfilled historically at Calvary. Pentecost, fulfilled historically 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. Then that large separation between the springtime and the fall harvest. Then comes tabernacles, which has never been fulfilled historically, but is just about to, because the battle of Gog and Magog may have already begun with the invasion of Israel by those terrorist Hamas and the rockets lobbed into Israel by Hezbollah, both Iranian backed, because that battle will begin when a confederation of the Islamic states, I said, Islamic states. I love Oprah. There are not many ways to heaven. I've been to the tomb of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I've been to the tomb of the great, greatest civil rights leader that God ever gave the earth, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have been there. They are conspicuous because of who lays there. But I've been to an empty tomb in Jerusalem, and it is conspicuous because there ain't nobody there. He got up. Somebody shout, he got up. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to my text. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel shall be preached throughout the world. Let's thank God for a church that preaches the gospel around the world. It'll be a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Do you know that when I first decided I want to go live around the world by television, the first time I did it was in the early 90s. How many of you were not born in 1990? See, that's what I'm looking at, they're afraid. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. The first time I did that, we had to purchase an uplink and link to a satellite and then shoot that down and then get network stations to carry it, just to beam it to the satellite. $100,000 to go live for one hour. This church has been live for the last four hours and it didn't cost a dime. Are you listening to me? This gospel is being preached for a witness around the world and then the end shall come. This gospel, not another gospel, 
The apex of all Christian endeavor must become to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior, that the Lamb of God slain may receive the reward of his suffering. So what is this gospel? Shout the gospel. No, no. I, I was watching. Half of you didn't even move your chin. Come on now. I'm an audience participation preacher. I don't keep talking unless you talk back. Are you ready? Say this gospel. I love that. You do Give yourself a hand. That's wonderful. Listen, if we gave a survey to most evangelical Christians and asked this question, what is the gospel? See how quiet it gets? What is it? So I'm going to explain it for you. Are you ready? You got a notepad? You got a pen? You got some lipstick? Eyeliner? Whatever you've got. You ready? Here's the gospel. Now I spent the entire message on what these four points I'm going to give you right now. But that's just the introduction. So help me, Jesus. Reach a hand out to me and say, help that white boy, Jesus. Says, help Help him. Number one, you ready? Jesus loves you. How much? How much? For God so loved, never has been more meaning, been packed into two letters and one monosyllable than so. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would just believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, your Christian life and mine do not make one bit of sense unless we believe that in the depth of our being. Jesus loves me. This, I know, I'm convinced because the Bible tells me so. Not because I had some emotional experience. Today we want people to make a decision for Christ. A decision is the first step. A decision is just you weighed the options and made a choice, a decision. But after you have a decision, you have to have a confession. Do they have McDonald's in Texas? So you look at all the health nuts, they, they want to act like they don't know what McDonald's is. Like the golden arches are now. Look, you pull up. There's that screen, it hasn't changed, I know, for 40 years. There it is. And you're going to make a decision. Do you want a quarter pounder with cheese, if you please, or do you want a Big Mac? That's it. And so you choose. You'll have one of each. And you choose that thing, right? You made a choice. I have a question for you Texans. Are you still hungry? So you pull on up to that little squawk box. And you make a confession. I will have both. Are you still hungry? Because all a confession is, is an admission of guilt. Now you pull on up to window number two, and there's a conversion. And you're no longer hungry. The problem with the 20th century and the 21st century church is Christianity without Christ. The gospel with decisions and not conversions. 
What we're after is life change, dynamic, unanswerable, unstoppable life change where you become a new creature that has never existed before and the devil has never had to deal with. Somebody shall take that devil. Do you believe in the depths of your being that Jesus loves you? His plea to us today is come to me. Now, you wounded, you frightened, you angry, you lost, you lonely, and I will meet you where you are and I will love you as you are. Stop thinking you have to try to clean up for Jesus. He will love you as you are because you are never going to be anything other than as you are. He will love you as you are because you're never going to be what you should be. Do you really believe that, that Jesus loves you? Do you really believe it? With all the wrong turns you've made? Come on now, remember somebody that knows you real well sitting in that row with you right now. With all your past mistakes, your broken promises, your moments of selfishness, your moments of dishonesty, honesty, and degraded love, do you really believe that Jesus loves you? No, I'm not, talk I'm not talking about the person in front of you. I'm not talking about Pastor Troy. I'm not talking about the church. I'm not even talking about the world. I'm simply talking about you. That he loves you. Beyond unworthiness. Beyond your infidelity. That you are loved. Sometimes when you get it right, but all the time when you get it wrong. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. The broken, the bruised, the battered, the left behind, the broken hearted. Those with the mask on. I can tell you today, God loves you in the morning sun and he will still love you in the evening rain. Without caution, without regret, without boundary, no matter what's gone down, God has an issue. He simply cannot stop loving you. Number two, Jesus died for you. On that angry, mean, biting, being called Calvary, suffering, sighing, crying, dying, bleeding by which the very veins of God himself were emptied to show you how much he loved you. Number three, Jesus was raised from the dead. Not Mohammed, not Hari Hari Krishna, not Mohammed. It's the apex of our hope in God. It's the crown jewel of our faith. It is the unanswerable demonstration of the profoundest fact concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And it's your hope and mine today. It's what separates Christianity from other, other so-called religion of the world. Christianity is the only religion that began in an, in an empty womb and ended with an empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Number four, this is my favorite. Jesus can change your life. I'm going to try for the saved people back there. Jesus can change your life. I know. He changed mine. Number five, and we'll move on. Once I've established with you what this gospel is. Number five is important. The Bible has stood 
as the best seller of all time, including today, because it is 1,000% accurate in its predictions. Not one thing it said would come to pass, has not. And everything he has said will come to pass exactly as he said. Once you have a hold of absolute truth, you let nothing turn your plow. Certainly not a bankrupt culture that wants to confuse your children that they can't understand what sex they are. Run for school board, take it over, stop the madness. Stop backing down, stop shirking away. I have determined that whenever and wherever men and women suffer such persecution, I will be silent no more. Our times demand it, our history compels it, and the future of this great nation depends on it. Here's five, eternity is real. And there are only two options. Every person in this room, every person watching online, every person watching on a webcast, every single person that hears this message is going to live forever. This is the gospel. But I'm from Eastern Kentucky. You notice I talk slowly. Every person is going to live forever somewhere. It is appointed unto man once to die, but for some folks twice. The death rate among human persons, watch now, this is startling information. You will not hear this on CNN or Fox. The death rate among humans has never changed. It's 100%. You're not getting out of here alive unless you're a part of the rapture. Or unless your name was Elijah or Enoch. I want to take you now to a very familiar place. The book of Revelation, chapter 21. Verse 5, then he said to me, write, for these words are faithful and true. He had to say that because what comes next is too good to be true. Shove your neighbor and say, it's too good to be true. He who overcomes will inherit all things. Shall that's me. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But the fearful, if you write in your Bible, circle the word fearful. Oh, is it up there? Look at that. But the fearful, the who? Well, then he goes on and says, the unbelieving. But what was first? The abominable, but what was first? The murderers, but what was first? the sexually immoral and sorcerers, but what was first? And all liars, but what was first? Will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. What was first in the list? The fearful. Not the idolaters, not the adulterers, not the sorcerers, not the witches and the warlocks, the fearful. Because fear and faith cannot live in the same mind, they cannot exist in the same heart, nor in the same spirit, and they surely can't abide in the same mouth. Are you with me so far? Ah. 
one of the seven angels, verse number nine, came to me and said, come and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, carried me away and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light like a most precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal, 1,400 miles square. That's the difference from Atlanta, Georgia to Flagstaff, Arizona. 1,400 miles. This is not a dream, dear friend. This is not a fantasy, sir, but this is our eternal home. Somebody tell me the four directions. Good, good, who, who shouted that out? God bless you, stand up. I'm gonna give you all the product on my table. What are the directions? North. Again. One more time. Stop. That's the way you were taught in school. That's not the way God says it. Be seated. You're welcome. North, south, east, west. That's what we all say. We also say night and day, day and night. We say day and night, God says night and day. And the evening and the morning were the first day. We calculate it, if they leave the time alone, day and night, amen? So you can't just read the Bible, you have to like really read it. You have to pay attention. It continues. It had a great wall with 12 gates, three on each of its four sides. At the gates, 12 angels, on the gates, the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. Isn't it amazing? They're still there even after the millennium. Go ahead, try to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Good luck. Israel is the apple of God's eye in Jerusalem, that shimmering diamond on a velvet couch, the exact geographic center of the entire earth. They're God's people. They're our people. We have the honor of being grafted in. We have a Jewish Jesus. With all due respect, he was not white or black, he was brown. Verse 13, on the east, three gates. So God doesn't begin with the north. He begins with the east. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And he ends up on the west, three gates. Second Peter, one chapter, verse, chapter one, verse 11, shouts it to us. We and I, you, you and I have an abundant entrance. I'm only gonna give you one quote, I'll usually give you 10. William Booth, the founder of the Great Salvation Army said, if I had my choice, I wouldn't send you to school. I'd send you to hell for five minutes and you'd come back a soul winner. On the east, three gates. The sun rises in the east. That's why he begins there. When that sun breaks meridian horizon and a new day is birthed, it speaks to us of hope. It speaks to us of the dawn of new life. It speaks to us that their yesterday is gone and today is on the way and I only have a future. This speaks to us of those who come to Christ as children. Theirs is the eastern gate. Do you know when most people accept Jesus? 50% before they're 10 years old. 50% of every person on earth serving Jesus today accepted him before they were 10 years old. Another 25% by the time they're 18 years old. So from birth 
to 18 years old, 75% of people will come to Jesus or not. Where does the church place its emphasis? Thirty-five years old and up, six percent will ever accept Jesus. After you're sixty-five years old, your chances of coming to Christ, think of the packed out nursing homes. Think of during COVID, just in New York City alone, the thousands of people that were ushered into eternity in a week as a result of that demonic COVID. Your chances of coming to Jesus after 65, one in 750,000. The gospel would have to be presented to one, to 750,000 to win one person 65 years or older to Jesus. 75% before they're 18. 750,000 to one after they're 65. 25% between 18 and 65. When's the last time you brought a child to church? Let's do it. Let's do it next week. While the Eastern Gate is open, You've got a niece, you've got a nephew. Some of you have children that aren't here today and I'm not criticizing you. I'm just trying to flash the warning sign. We've got to reach the children. The Eastern Gate is open before sorrow rolls in like a black cloud over their lives, before their bodies are defiled, before disease squeezes the very life out of them, before their mind is crippled by drugs and alcohol, before they marry some ungodly heathen, have children, get divorced, and ruin their lives and those of those children. Young person, hear me today. God has three gates open for you. Come to the gate. Don't wait. Tomorrow is promised to no one. On the north, three gates. On the north wind in your Bible always symbolizes trouble. Jeremiah said a sword comes from the north. Ezekiel said a fire comes from the north. The north wind begins to pick up strength with age. The north wind is cold. The north wind is bitter. It brings sorrow and disappointment, children and debts. One of the most difficult ages is this one where the north gate is open, but it's where the majority of people are. Sandwiched somewhere between taking care of your children and taking care of your aging parents. That's hard, man. All the adulting, all the difficulties that life can throw at you, Many of you even today feel the chill of the north wind even now. You may be living in your moment of greatest sorrow and greatest difficulty. Let me ask you this question. How many millions have come to saving knowledge in Jesus Christ in the middle of tragedy, in the middle of trouble? I'm talking to soul winners in this church. How many hearts become open to Christ when a doctor says you have to die and you cannot live? The frosty billows of heartache, of heartbreak 
are often used by God Almighty to soften those hardened hearts just enough to cause us to reach a trembling hand to heaven and call upon the name of Jesus Christ for the only help that can truly help us. Remember this, 50% of those crucified with Jesus prayed in their darkest moment of fear, of torment, and deepest pain, and they made it to heaven that same day. I'm reaching out to you now. Those of you at the North Gate, while the howling winds are blowing angrily upon you, many of you here today have felt its biting grip. You feel battered and beaten down by life. You feel like in Satan's salvage yard. Some of you are putting up a good facade, but inside, if we could really see you're hurting and you're hurting terribly. Some have already hit rock bottom, but they're still keeping up the facade. Some have entered the Hotel California. They keep stabbing it with those steely knives, but they just can't kill the beast. The paralyzing pain of addiction, of drugs, of alcohol, of sex, of gambling, of failure, all the hard knocks of everyday drudgery of just living has made some feel that dying looks easy. Let me welcome you to the North Gate to meet Jesus. Right in the middle of your trouble, your tragedy, your trial, your difficulty, your disappointment, your hurt, he'll change your life. I have a watch It's pretty nice. My wife bought this one for me. It was one George W. Bush wore during the presidential inauguration. I I like watches. I never set them. According to this one, it's 10 till 4. I heard that. Somebody way back over there said, it feels like it. Don't say that. So, so, If this watch breaks, there's not one thing I can do about it. But I know that somewhere there's a watch creator. I have proof. And if I can find the man that made it, I can find the man that can put it all back together again. My prayer for you, our prayer for you right now today is that your heart will become open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say this. Church, whatever it takes, you're surrounded by those at the North Gate. Whatever it takes, We must cry out, God, don't let them end up in hell. (laughs) Let them lose everything they have. This is the way the church used to pray. Not, oh God, bless them. Make it hot on them, Jesus. If they have to lose everything they've ever had, Let misery become an unwelcome visitor at their door. Let them hit rock bottom. But don't let them end up in that unimaginable, horrible, torturous place called hell forever. Whatever it takes. The word cancer. When facing tragedy, There are those who will think of Jesus who never gave him a thought before. The best place for you to win a soul? Beside a hospital bed. Wherever there's grief, 
at a funeral. Jesus wasn't very popular at funerals. He broke them all up. Get up. There are a whole lot of your family, a whole lot of your friends, and you need to reach them for Jesus. You only need two things to be a fisher of men. Number one, you need some bait. Guess what that is? Your kindness, you know, to that gal that washes your head and then puts those stenchions in. Do you tell everybody that's all natural? <laughs> kindness. Kindness to the person that delivers your newspaper. Kindness to the person where you're pumping your gas. Kindness. Please don't put a Jesus on your bumper sticker and then act like hell. Please don't go to the restaurant when we're finished here and be talking about church and not leave a tip. Kindness, goodness. Jonah, and then what's the hook? Your story. You don't need a theology degree. All you need is to tell your story. I need everybody that has a story of how Jesus changed your life to shout until hell hears it. You know what makes this church so profoundly powerful? If you would just share the announcements about what you all are doing for God with everybody you know. Everybody you know would want to know the God you serve. Just tell the story. 70% of the people in Fort Worth, 70% will be born in America and die in America and not one person will ever in their lifetime invite them to church one time, 70%. When you get to be my age, questions haunt you. You know the one that haunts me most? What are we doing? God, can you imagine if I, I, I told pastor in last service, I'm, I'm bringing a check for $10,000. I'm not here to make money. I'm here to preach this gospel. And I'm bringing a check for $10,000 from City Harvest Network to help you all continue to do what you're doing. Can you imagine if we had 1,000 churches that would get on board with what you're doing, we could bring Jesus back. I'm closing. I've actually closed twice. You just didn't notice. 80% of church leaders serving today accepted Jesus before their 13th birthday. We have a 10 year window between age four and 14 to bring them to Jesus. 90 million of America's 300 million, 90 million of America's 300 million, 90 million of America's 300. Do you know why the gays and the lesbians and whatever else, the alphabet they've got now, do you know why they're targeting schools? Do you understand why they're coming in and doing gay pride events to elementary students? Do you know why? They know what Hitler knew and he knew what what Jesus knew, suffer the little children to come unto me. That's where it is. That's the evangelism field. We have a 10 year window between age 10 and 14 to bring them into the kingdom of God. 10 years. 80% of that 90 million will never one time in their life go to church. Man, I'm, I'm building a whole new children's wing. I already built one of only two handicap accessible playgrounds in our entire city. Just so the news media would come out and tell the story. Tell that story. 
Tell them that Miss Joni raised half a million dollars to pay the, for that thing. And it's open to everybody. Bring me your huddled masses, your hurting children, your abused little leaguers. your lonely cheerleaders. We gotta reach them. Why is the church always trying to drag them out of the gutter after they've spent their entire life in it? Young people have energy, they have strength, they have vitality, they can pray, they can witness, they're unfettered by marriage, they're the greatest soldiers in the army of God. Don't forget them, please, please don't forget them. I'd like for this church to double its children's workers by next Sunday. Change a dirty diaper, clean up some spilled milk, but bring them to Jesus. Eastern gates open. Well, the southern gate won't take me long. That's the sunshine gate. Everything's happy there. Everything's going great. Life's a cabaret. It's just a party. Your family's got their health. You've got a family. You've got a great income. Everything looks great. I want to invite you today to look a little bit beyond what you've got to the one that gave it to you. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Do you know why I shout? Because the doctor looked at me with vocal cords covered with cancer and said, you may never speak again. And I spent two years barely whispering. Don't think I don't get up every morning and with that first breath and first vocalization out of my heart and through my mouth be, thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, man. I get to be in Burleson, Texas. I get to have a microphone in one hand and a Bible in the other. I get to win souls, see the sick healed, see tormented people delivered. Thank you. If you got hands to clap, clap them. If you got a mouth to shout, shout. If you got a thank you in your heart, thank him, thank him, thank him. Stop looking at what you may have lost and start shouting over everything you've got. Man, what a joy to come to Christ through the Southern Gate, to fully surrender to His Lordship and still have your health and still have your home and still have a nice car and still have a family. And everything's going great before sorrow strikes. On the West, three gates. The sun's setting, evening shadows are growing long, shoulders are rounding, back not quite straight, your gait slower than it used to be, that raven black hair turns silvery gray underneath all that color. I was talking to the men. 
the underpinnings, you know, they start to go out. Many of your loved ones already in eternity, about to be 67. None of my family's been on this earth for the last decade. It can get lonely. You might even be sad. We don't understand the mercy of God. But hear me today. Even those that have spent their lives, now you hear me. Even those that have spent their lives cursing his name, mocking his people, rejecting his love, wasted lives, wasted energy, wasted time, giving no honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, no praise, no devotion. They've still got three gates. That's why they call grace amazing. He put some gates on the west side when the sun is setting for those that have climbed that shadowy mountain and twilight has come. Eyes have grown dim, tired and weak. Even then, the God we preach, the Christ we serve, still forgives, pardons, cleanses and redeems and regardless of what gate you're at today he's offering you eternal life and heaven to go to heaven in how beautiful heaven must be sweet home of the ransomed and free fair haven of rest for the weary how beautiful heaven must be but if walls there weren't jasper, and the streets were not gold, if every mansion would crumble, folks still grew old, still I'd see everything my heart longs to see. Because if Jesus is there, that'll be heaven for me. It won't matter if the gates are made of wood and swing on leather hinges. It won't matter if the mansions are cardboard shanties and there's mud in the streets knee deep. If Jesus is there, that'll be heaven for me. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Those of you watching all over the world, please pause at this moment. Right now, Jesus Christ stands on the victory side of an empty tomb and he says to you, I did this all for you. Come to me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Young person, 14 year old young lady from the state of Texas, had been in a church like this her whole life. She was the recipient of the Holy Spirit moving on the preacher that Sunday morning. He left the pulpit and walked down where she was and said, young lady, the Holy Spirit is telling me there's something very wrong. She began to weep. He said, are you right with Jesus? She said, no, pastor, and I love you and I love this church. I've been in this church my whole life. But the captain of the football team asked me to the senior prom. It's Friday night, pastor. I can't be saved on Friday night. But I promise you, on Sunday morning, I surrender my life to Jesus. Friday night came, she looked beautiful. Football captain 
put her in his pickup truck and off to the prom. They went, little school. A young man decided during the prom that he would slip out the door and light a cigarette. No one was aware that there had been a gas leak. He struck the match, and in a matter of seconds, that entire building was reduced to rubble. That pastor was called out on that Friday night to help. He walked up to the first body covered with a sheet. He pulled back the sheet, and there was the beautiful, angelic face of that 17-year-old girl in eternity on Friday. Sunday never came. Tomorrow's promise to no one. Young person, the gates open. Those of you struggling in the middle ages of life with enough trouble to shake a stick at, are you fully surrendered to Jesus? He can help you. Those of you that everything looks great, you're making good money, your family's well, but are you surrendered to the Lordship of Christ? There may be someone up in age watching right now in this room and you'll say, Pastor, I want to be sure I'm ready to meet Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. When I say three, you want to go to heaven and not hell, have life and not death, serve Jesus and make the enemy take his hands off of you forever. You want to know that you're as sure for heaven as if you were already there. When I say three, shoot your hands straight up in the air. No one else can make the decision for you. No one else can surrender for you. This is between you and God. This is the moment. Make the choice you'll be glad you made when you stand before God. On three. One, I'm not waiting. Eternity waits for no one. Hands are already going up. Two, this is it. On three. One, two, three. Raise that hand and leave it up. Just as quickly. Everyone that raised your hand, stand on your feet, do it now. If you're ashamed of Jesus, he'll be ashamed of you. This is the power of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. There are millions and millions in church on Sunday morning that think they're right until they hear the gospel. Here we go. Everybody pray with me. Lord Jesus, I come today to surrender my life to you. I was born a sinner and I have committed many sins. I ask you and you alone to forgive me. Give me eternal life. Satan, I renounce you. Self, you're no longer in control. Lord Jesus Christ, I accept you. I believe in you and I confess you as my personal Savior. I'll live for you from this moment with all my heart as you teach me how. And next Sunday, I'm going to bring somebody with me, especially a child. In Jesus' name, feel so good to be forgiven, I could almost clap and shout. Oh, why not? Welcome.